welcome to the people uh, that are joining us now. We're going to be going uh, diving into the middle of it in uh, a minute or two. We're just waiting for uh, some stragglers to come in and uh, then we'll get going. Um, if you want to say hi to Tiago, feel free to unmute or unvideo or whatever. Say hi in the comments. Um, just kind of hanging out and chit chatting for another minute or two here and then we'll really dive into it. So uh, let us know in the comments too if you are uh, if you're cooking along, uh, or if you're just watching to cook later, and kind of where you're joining from. I know Mike Bailey, North Dakota, I think. John and Linda, I don't remember where you guys are at. <laughs> just hoping we got it right. <laughs> let me go over there so I can see you guys too. <laughs> Uh, now we got the pressure coming on. Tiago's coming over. You want to make sure you uh, look good for him. <laughs> nice. Got to say, we're, uh, we're, we already cooked it. We're eating it and watching to see what we got wrong. <laughs> I love How that. did it taste? <laughs> wonderful. It's wonderful. The, I'll tell you what, the, uh, the, the crust on the lamb mm. is just to die for. Great recipe. Thank you. I really like that too. And uh, it, it's as simple as it can be, but there's so many things you can add to it. So uh, that's what one of the flavors that I like the most. Oh, I can't wait to make it. That's awesome. What do you think, Mike? Should we get this, uh, this party on the road? Absolutely. I'm, awesome. I'm, I haven't eaten in half a day, so I'm ready to, to eat through the screen here. I just ate a Philly cheesesteak and a, a bunch of pizza. So I'm uh, I'm ready for a nap, but uh, we're diving into this. We're doing this anyway. Tiago will keep me entertained. I have no doubts. <laughs> Everybody welcome Jason back from his grueling trip to Antigua, yeah. judging a yacht chef competition as well. I know, uh, you know, he, he made special amends to be here with us today so yeah, you don't know how tiring it is you have to like walk up all the stairs up to the sun decks on the yachts and then eat all the food and you know all the champagne they keep giving you it's it's really really grueling it was it was tough but uh but thanks to uh chef elizabeth lee who uh hooked, hooked me up with being a judge for that competition that was great to go out there and represent the isba uh in the <laughs> the caribbean islands and uh, hopefully get us some new uh, some new fun chefs. I think we might have a few uh, yacht chefs that might be joining and doing a few recipes. And I know Chef Lee has been uh, preaching uh, the benefits of sous vide to all of the, uh, the yacht chefs out there. So hopefully we can get a few more of them. It would be great. And if any of you don't know me, I'm Jason Logston from Amazing Food Made Easy and president of the ISVA, along with my co-founder, Mike Lachardi, the CEO and all all-knowing man behind the curtain. Um, and welcome to another ISVA Champions Cook Along. We've been doing these every month as a way to highlight some of our great members and learn to make incredible food. And these are free to anyone in the Champions of Sous-Vide Network, as well as access to more than 80 hours of sous-vide demos, presentations, and other content. And you can apply the cost of today's ticket to that event, um, or to this event, to the yearly membership, if you want to do that at the isva.net slash member. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the ISVA, welcome. We're a collaborative community of sous vide enthusiasts. We explore the technique, we learn from one another, and we network with like-minded individuals. Or as Mike likes to always say, we may try to make the world more delicious one meal at a time. So the way this cook along works is I will be emceeing, I'll be reading the chat, and I'll be bothering Chef Tiago while he's trying to teach us his amazing dishes. So if you have any questions, run into trouble with anything if you're cooking along, or for those of you that pre-cooked, if you have questions that, that he glosses over that you might have stumbled with while you were cooking it, drop those in the chat and I will interrupt him and I will demand answers to those questions. Um, so um, I think that's a good way to approach it. And then if you uh, wanna ask your, a question yourself, you can always just dive in and um, unmute, uh, let me know, and then I'll let you uh, unmute and you can have some FaceTime uh, with Tiago to make sure that he gets to see your lovely faces as well. So without further ado, the next uh, cook along that I'm happy to promote is an up and coming chef out of Houston, Texas, who runs Robusto Feud Food House, offering cooking classes, private chef services, and even a line of smoked olive oil and salts. His cuisine is a blend of classic French technique influenced by regional Texas fare combined with the flavors of his hometown of Rio de Janeiro and other South American classics. So please help me welcome Tiago Corino from Robusto Food House. 
Hey everyone, how are you doing tonight? I'm very glad to be here. And first I want to thank two, three people, Mike and Jason and my wife, Valeria, she's behind the camera. So she's going to be following me around, pointing the camera up and down. So if I'm talking to a Valeria, it will be her, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and start. So I separate all the ingredients over here in front of me. So that way you guys can see and do the same thing. And I also have the list of the ingredients so I'm gonna go be reading. And then from there, we're gonna start cooking. Does that sound good? Okay, so in this side over here, I decided to put the, the polenta style, the polenta ingredient, sorry. It would be the corn cornmeal. This one, it's a little bit more grainy. So, but it's up to you if you can use the, just the fine one or the, the coarse. Uh, the cheese of choice today will be the Parmigiano Reggiano. You can use cream cheese, pecorino, maybe a mozzarella, uh, semi-dried. You don't want to use the uh, full moist one. And then to this side is the crushed side. So I have some parsley. The very piece. We're going to use a little bit less than this, but I always wanted to have a little bit more. Uh, black garlic. I, I left the package over here, so some people have never seen this before. Uh, it's easy to find in Houston, Texas, but uh, I'm sure you can get online and maybe the local store. So what is it's uh, black garlic versus regular garlic? So the black garlic, it's nothing more than just uh, cooked garlic in a very, very, very slow temperature. And sometimes it takes up to two weeks or even longer sometimes to get it to the black. So it's just like a you know, when we're cooking something and then turning to brown, like the crust of the lamb chops we're gonna do today. So it's pretty much the black garlic is being cooked at very low temperature for many hours and most of the time weeks. Awesome. And so all I did, it was just to peel. Uh, I gave the option of having the powder or just uh, the, the cloves, whatever you guys can find. So today we're gonna be using this. And a little bit of a panko could be, so this one I had in the house, it was an Italian brand. So they have a little bit more herbs on it. Um, but to be honest, you can use anything because it's just a thickener. So because we want to be as a paste, we don't want the crust to be any liquid. So we're gonna go ahead and use a little bit of uh, panko bread. So that way it's, it's like a paste we can easily put in the lamb chops. And then as a binder, we have some Dijon mustard as well. And when we blend this, we're gonna use a little bit of olive oil if we have to. And then going to the last portion over here will be the confit tomatoes. So I separate a couple herbs. So I have rosemary and sage. Of course, you can use thyme, any other herb you want. A little bit of uh, garlic powder some cherry tomatoes. I have a little combination of different colors and a little bit of uh, red pepper flakes as well. You can use black pepper or red. You can even use uh, jalapeno or habanero, whatever you want to uh, uh, confit the tomatoes with. It just gives a little kick of spicy. And of course you can eat after as well. And a little bit of salt. In this case today, I'm using a truffle salt uh, if you guys would like to buy, just let me know. I have some available. So let's go ahead and start doing the confit. So I'm gonna go, I have a little bag. It could be a zip log. Let's go ahead and put this inside the bag. Put all the herbs, a little bit of the garlic powder. And then some people can substitute the garlic powder. Uh, for fresh garlic, but I know there is a type of contamination. Sometimes we don't want to use fresh garlic to sous vide uh, for, because we only want to be sous vide the tomatoes for about 30, to one, 30 minutes to one hour. So some people don't like to use it. That's why I'm using the garlic powder. But if you feel that you want to use the garlic cloves, uh, you can roast in the oven with a little bit of olive oil. So that way you can also, you pretty much confine before you put in the bag with the tomatoes. Little bit of the red pepper flakes, some truffle salt.
and olive oil. And you can use any oil you want, to be honest. I do prefer olive oil for, for vegetables, but feel free to use any oil you want. And the, 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 you know, the, the good thing about sous vide, if you do it, you, you can also do this in the oven. You just have to put in a, like a glass container so you can infuse and bake very slow. I would say 220 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. You put in the oven, but, and then you have to put a lot more olive oil because you're doing everything inside the bag. You don't need that much. You could be something like this. So I'm gonna go ahead and vacuum seal this. I have in the corner over there because it's elevated. So all I'm gonna, all I can move over here so to show you guys. Sorry about the noise. That's a fancy stand you got there, Tiago. I like that. <laughs> yeah, that was a gift for a friend and I end up using for vacuum seeing liquids. <laughs> And of course, this brand over here, they even come with a little accessory port. Uh, it helps with liquid, but I thought it would be easier to just have it elevated. Let's put it over here, close it. And you have to be quick because the liquid is going to start moving up very fast. And then I don't want to squeeze the tomatoes too much. So I'll make sure to stop as soon as I, I heat about halfway. So let's go ahead and do it. I can see the olive oil moving closer to the seal part. That's where I want to stop because if you let the olive oil go above the mark, uh, you, you might not have a good seal, right? And uh, I always like to seal twice, just for safety reasons, because I don't, I don't want to lose the food if you open inside the, the sous vide bag, right? Okay. That's how it's gonna look. And I'm, because I'm doing almost like an individual portion, uh, that's, that's it, so it's only 10 tomatoes. And I already have the lamb chops already been cooking here. So I'm gonna go ahead and take advantage of already having the water and the machine working and just drop in there. Of course, you can do, you can do longer, you can do a higher temperature. Some people like to do 150 for an hour. Uh, but um, I test it with uh, 130 degrees, 140. They all taste good the same way. I'm gonna go ahead and put this back here. Uh, doing tomatoes like that is one of my favorite uh, side dishes. When I was doing a bunch of hands-on cook-along classes, like that mm -hmm. was one of the ones that like, if you're like, wait, we're just putting tomatoes in like with olive oil and some herbs and like whatever temperature the sous vide machine set at basically. I'm like, yeah, but yeah. wait till you try it. And that was the <laughs> one thing that they would just plow through and it was converted several people to sous vide cooking. Yeah, and then they're so rich, then you don't actually want that many. You know, sometimes you use three, like for this recipe, I'm trying to make for one to two person, uh, uh, two people, and then uh, just like maybe five per plate per person, it's more than enough. Well, let's go ahead and move to the crust. Gonna pack the the fresh uh, parsley over here, the rosemary, the black garlic. I'm gonna go ahead and start with uh, three cloves. The cheese. I'm gonna save a little bit of the cheese as well. I don't because it, it's easy for you to start with a little less and then move to more, right? I feel and like that's one crumb. of the universal first laws of cooking is that you can start with less and go to more, but you can't go the opposite direction, right? That's right. You, and you, sometimes you learn that in a bad way, but let's go ahead and post this. Okay, it's looking very good, but it's a little dry. 
So I'm going to go ahead and put a dash of olive oil. And this olive oil, it's being infused with uh, herbs like rosemary, thyme, garlic, and smoke as well. It's also available if you guys would like to purchase. And if you want to see an amazing demo about how to make sous vide smoked olive oil yourself, you can check out our previous showcase where Tiago demonstrated his amazing technique. Free to all champions of sous vide members. <laughs> all right, so I think... I got the consistency that I want. Let me show it to you guys. Safety first, I always remove the blade. Okay, let me move this way so you guys can see. So with the consistency, it's pretty much like a wet sand. So that way it will stick to the lamp chops. You guys see it? Oh uh, yeah, I, the texture is interesting on it. Yeah, you don't want it to be too dry, so you're gonna fell off. Even though you're gonna use it to be the, the binder or the Dijon Master, we still want to hold the shape. So let's go ahead and reserve that. So I'm, uh, I'll, I'm, I'm all in favor of cleaning as you cook. So that way it's not a mess when you finish and your wife won't scream at you when you're doing that. I was say, don't, don't tell Jody that's an option. Otherwise uh, she would expect <laughs> me to start doing that too. Yeah, I don't, I heard too many times. So uh, I prefer it. So <laughs> this way, uh, oh, one good observation for the, the garlic. In this case, I use the black garlic, right? So. Let's say if you don't find the black garlic, you're gonna usually you're gonna go ahead and use the regular garlic. The reason I don't want you to use fresh garlic is because we only gonna put in the broil for a very short period of time. So because the sous vide already cooked the lamb, all the ingredients over here, it's okay to eat raw. So I got the cheese, you got the panko, all that. Because we only have a very short cooking time in the inside of the oven, or sometimes you can even use the blowtorch to sear. So if you use fresh garlic, you're gonna taste like fresh garlic in your mouth. So I don't recommend using that. You can use a black garlic or a garlic powder. That makes sense? Definitely. And uh, John Schaefer uh, put in the comments, he said, uh, that mixture is, the crust mixture is simply the very best. <laughs> That's a big fan of it. Yeah, I agree. A lot of people say that lamb chops does not have a very strong uh, flavor to it. It, and it's special for this recipe. I, yeah, I'm sure you guys noticed that I didn't marinate the lamb chops because for me, the star would be the crust. And then so that way, uh, but if I'm doing a lamb chops and it doesn't have any crust, I'm gonna marinate it. So that we can do in a different video uh, because I like to do that as well. But in this case, the star of the day should be the crust, right? That's why we, we put in a little bit more effort to this one because the lamb chops, uh, it only being sous vide with a little bit of olive oil, uh, salt, pepper, and that's it, okay? So we, we're almost done, guys. It, it's gonna be a very fast day, okay? So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna set the, the broil to, to already start, oh, well, we can wait in the broil actually because we still have to make the polenta and that takes a good 20 minutes. Okay, so we're gonna start moving towards this side over here. I already have the, the broth and of course you can use water. Uh, if you're using water, you can put a little bit of salt inside. So that way you polenta gonna have a little salt to start. In this case, I'm using a combination of uh, chicken broth and vegetable broth. Uh, I think it, it really gives a little bit more flavor to it. So I'm gonna start moving things close to the stove over here. So what we're gonna do is, for those that never made uh, polenta, we, uh, we're gonna bring it to a boil, the broth or the water, and then we're gonna put it slowly, the corn cornmeal, 
and I'm gonna we're gonna uh, risk for a couple of minutes to make sure that it's all dissolved. We don't want because if you're using the like a spoon like this, when you start the process, you're gonna notice that it's more clumps, and then we want to be silky smooth as the best we can. So that's why we start with this, and then we finish with the spoon. And then we're gonna finish. Uh, the last thing we're gonna do is cold butter. Uh, I believe I put one tablespoon for one cup of uh, cornmeal. But if you're using more, you can use a couple more tablespoons of butter and more cheese as well. And you remember, I always like to save a little bit of the cheese to put on top after the, the polenta is cooked. So we're gonna put about 80% of the cheese now and then save the 20% just to sprinkle a little bit on top of the plate. Okay, so all we're waiting for this to, to broil, to boil, sorry. And then let's go ahead and take the lamb chops then. So that way we can already see that too. So these sweets are already been cooking for hour and a half, close to two hours. And I only have a half rack, so it's only four bones. Mike asked, uh, have you ever made polenta cakes and how does that process differ? Do you have to make them drier so you can form them? Well, what you do is usually when you do the day after. So let's say you make the polenta for your family and then you have some leftover. You don't wanna trash it, but maybe the polenta the next day is not as good as the day you make. So you take from the fridge, you put inside like a little mold uh, and then you pop in the, uh, the in the freezer. So you're gonna, let's say you're using a disc. So you're gonna put all the polenta inside the mold, gonna pop in the, the freezer for a couple hours or overnight. The day after that, or when it's solid frozen, what you have to do is just a panko, uh, just bread it, you know, and just a little bit of eggs, uh, flour, eggs, and panko, and then you deep fry or you pop in the oven. Awesome. So for this, guys, I already, I already see her before and I see after. I like to see her bo both times before and after. So that way we can get the most, the best of the crust, right? I'm gonna pat it dry. Let me move this over here so you guys can see a little better. Okay. I'm gonna go back to the stove over here. And I have my blue torch. I love having the, the second hand to help mute the, uh, the loud noises. That's very helpful. Good job behind the camera. <laughs> John said it's the first time he had ever pre-seared anything with sous vide and that wor it worked very, very well. Can you talk a little bit about why you would uh, pre-sear versus uh, times that you would only post-sear? Well, for this case, uh, that's a very good question. And I asked the same question to my chefs uh, when I went to culinary school, why would I see it before and after? And then the, the, the best explanation he gave me was like, do you like flavor? You know, the answer is always what? yes. And then I was like, well, so if you sear before, you, you take advantage of more flavor inside the bag 
because the colonization and the myeloid effect, the reaction. And then when you see it after, you reinforce that flavor as well. So you're not cooking, you're not, you're just searing. So that's why I use the torch because that we can pop in the broil with the crust, crust later and just finish cooking. But I want to make sure that I have the most flavors possible at the dish. So especially when we talk about protein, we're going to go ahead and sear as strong as we can. And then that way we can have a better result in the end. It makes a lot of sense. Awesome. Thank you, Chef. You're welcome. All right. So I have my broil, uh, my, sorry, my broth broil boiling. It's very hard, but... I'm going to, I have a one cup of cornstarch. I'm going to go, just go ahead and put, I know this is a bigger cup, so I'm going to go ahead and leave it a little bit over here. And then I'm going to stir this the best I can, make sure I remove all the lumps. So for, I think the good calculation for polenta, in, in my opinion, it's for every cup of cornstarch, four cups of water or broth. And then you have to put in consideration then every time you start boiling something, you, you start evaporating liquid. So you can put a little bit more broth or a little less cornstarch, uh, cornmeal, sorry. So I'm happy with the, I'm happy with the, the result over here. I don't see a lot of clumps. So I'm gonna go ahead and move this to a simmer and I'm gonna stir this a little bit, a couple of times. So I'm actually moving to a medium low heat. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and put this in the low heat and I'm gonna put a lid on. Have you attempted to make polenta with sous vide before? No, no, I don't, I, I'm not sure if you're gonna work. Uh, but we can also always try it, right? Uh, we talked to someone that did it and I couldn't remember who it was and but they were I think the only person I know that had done it so far hmm. I, I wonder how it's gonna work but I would love to see that video yeah, you definitely would need to use less liquid right because you'd have no evaporation uh, during the cooking process right and then you're gonna have to set this to be very high close to the boiling point mm -hmm. and then you have used less liquid for sure so you pretty much uh, rehydrating the polenta with the liquid. My, but I love to try, it would be interesting. So a lot of people think the polenta, you have to be on it the entire time. But if you're putting low and then you check with the, a couple minutes in there, that's more than enough. We don't have to be here for 30 minutes doing this. You just have to stir, make sure it's not burning anything. And you also want to be careful because this stuff is really, really hot and you can burn yourself too. So meanwhile, I'm going to go ahead and move and start putting the crust on the lamb chops. We can do over here in the island. So for this one, I like to use my hands. So I'm gonna go ahead and put gloves on. And then we're gonna go ahead and put the, the crust and the lamb chops. And then the crust, you have two choices now. You can cut these in half or individual portions and then put the crust on and put it in the oven. But when you do that, you're cooking the lamb chops a lot more, 
when you put it in the oven. So I'm gonna keep as the whole and I'm only gonna slice when we're ready to plate it. So all you do, you put in top of the lamb chops. Oh, and then I don't know if you, you guys remember, when you cook the lamb chops, when you buy from the supermarket, there's a, a thicker piece of the fat than is on top of here. And then over here, we have the, the loin, right? And the ribs. So sometimes there's a lot of fat over here. You wanna make sure you trim that out. You don't have to take the whole thing, but definitely take the, the, the loose part. Sometimes it even comes out with you if you pull it. Mike wanted to know what was the hardest thing to learn in culinary school? The hardest thing. Hmm. Let me think. Was there anything, any techniques or anything that you struggled a little more to, to get down? Well, and John says patience. <laughs> I, <laughs> you do have to be patient as well and it takes a long time. In, and my culinary school was French. So I have to take a lot of French jokes for my chefs. But the worst part, I think that it was not technique, but it was uh, when they, they told me I have to kill a lobster for the first time. So there was live lobster where we had to, you know, the, to, to cook them. And then the, for them, the most humane part is when you, to, you put the knife to the head, uh, so you have to do that and with the you know with the the lobster some of them were very alive uh, some of them was already half dead so that was the i think it was the one of the hardest moments because even though i like to eat protein i don't want to do the dirty job i want to be already in, in my hands so all i have to do is just cook it yeah, jody uh always jokes that she like she likes uh only the meat that grows in the packaging on the trees Right, yeah, I, I, I'm with her. I have a lot of respect for the, uh, respect for the animals, uh, then you know, providing you know their life to us. But I don't want to do the job. Okay, so now I'm just starting to make sure that it's not uh, burning the bottom, but it's cooking very nicely and slow. So at this point, we don't want to put any cheese, right? Because it's still cooking, still very hot. If we put the cheese now, you're going to start breaking the particles of the, of the cheese, separating the milk and all this stuff, and we don't want it. I'm going to go ahead and set the, the, uh, the broil in the oven. Takes a couple of minutes. His mine goes all the way to 525. Uh, of course, you can do that with the blowtorch. It's, uh, it's your choice. I prefer to do it over here. And uh, because I already see here, all the sides underneath, I'm pretty much just trying to cook whatever is in the top just to firm up a little bit. Uh, but everything over here can actually be eating raw. So, but we wanna make sure we cook a little bit more. So this one, I'm just gonna move over here. And then the tomato is still cooking guys. So over here, easily we can keep for an hour, maybe even more, but today we want to keep everything close to an hour. So that way everybody knows if I want to make a very nice dinner, you only takes an hour, or if you count this V time up to three hours. Okay, do you have any questions for me? Because right now we're just stirring this. I'll bother the people in the comments. Um, any of you have any, uh, any good questions that you have? Uh, what's the difference in flavor between the black garlic and the regular garlic? The black garlic, it's a lot sweeter. And then it doesn't really taste much garlic to me. Uh, so definitely you have the sweetest side of the garlic. So I, I do recommend and if you never try, go ahead and do it. Uh, start from the fresh one. And you can substitute the black garlic with any regular 
dish that you would do with the, the regular garlic. So definitely sweeter and then very rich in umami. So if you guys already know umami, uh, let's say it's the fifth element, right? And uh, so I'll definitely recommend trying. Well, I think going to take a few more minutes, but we want to make sure that we start trying. And then I don't know if you guys noticed, I didn't put any salt in the polenta so far because uh, I want to adjust the season in the end. So let's say you're using salted butter, they're going to bring salt to it. The, the, the broth that I have over here, I already have a little bit of salt as well. So, and then the cheese has salt. So that way we're gonna keep adding layers of flavor. And then we're only gonna finish the salt uh, a little bit before we finish. Okay, so it's almost there. Mike says he's been using black garlic with sour cherry powder and brown sugar on pork loin um, mm. before cooking it. And it's been enjoying that a lot. Oh yeah, it's, you can even spread in the, in like a bread and just eat it as well. I like the flavor a lot. And John was wondering how it compares to like roasted garlic, which also kind of gets sweeter and uh, and a little nutty. The the it the definitely you're gonna we're, you're gonna taste a lot the the umami that I was talking a little bit before. You you get the sweetness from, but not as not as much as the roast. The roast you're gonna do get a little bit of the. You're still gonna have more bitterness and a little bit of uh, sweet, but the black garlic, it's a lot sweeter. And then it's like a umami bomb. Like uh, sometimes you can buy even the powder. So the powder, because it's being dehydrated, you don't get much of the, the sweetness to it. But when you go for the fresh uh, clove, you're gonna notice a lot of the flavor. Okay. And then if you guys notice it's burning a little bit at the bottom of the polenta, you can easily remove the pan from the fire, even though I'm having low over here, my burn is, it's big, right? So I can easily just move it to the side, stir. And then if I want a little bit more heat, I bring it back to the burner. So when you're cooking in your house and you notice things is not going, as you, uh, as you please, feel free to use the pan back and forth. Don't, don't get nervous because you, you know, it's burning or it's cooking too fast. Make sure because the pan is hot, the liquid's hot, whatever you're cooking, it's hot enough. They can continue cooking for you. You can easily just do this, make sure, cool a little bit the pan. I can leave it over there if I want to and then you can always bring it back to the burner. I often do that when I accidentally light pans on fire. <laughs> Done that too, Mike. All right, Jason. Uh, John says this, this course should have been called the master class in garlic. He's loving it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in, in Brazil, if it, we don't have garlic, we'll, something's wrong. Okay, a few more minutes. So you know when the polenta is ready, it's when you, you cannot taste the flour too much. So the flakes there, they cook faster because all the liquid you put it on. But when you taste it, you start tasting a little bit of uh, like a raw flour almost. So you know you still have a couple of minutes to go. So because we know we're getting close in this, my broil should be 
to the highest temperature. We're gonna go ahead and put this on and we're gonna watch. So it doesn't burn. I want to know, you guys are going to do sous vide for Christmas? Yeah, let us know in the comments what you're, uh, what you're making for Christmas. I think that's uh, uh, always exciting. I know I have, uh, I was doing some testing of the, the meaderies Wagyu beef. And so I have some, an Australian um, uh, tri-tip, I think, in the freezer. So I'm going to pull that out, I think, for our uh, sous vide that for Christmas dinner. Nice. I'm gonna do a Wellington. So oh, nice. I definitely, I definitely gonna sous vide the, the beef tenderloin. Uh, so the temperature that I like, I'm gonna do the mushrooms, wrap it up, and just finish in the oven. Awesome. I haven't done a Wellington in years and years, and I should probably try one again since I'm a lot better uh, cook than I was uh, a decade ago. I could probably do a better job now. <laughs> Yeah, that dish really takes a, a lot of practice to get it right. Yeah. Uh, Mike says he's going to his sister's and just eat. <laughs> nice. I like that too. <laughs> Always good. Uh, John says he's doing uh, oh, Chef Lee's uh, filet mignon for Christmas uh, for the Wellington and then still looking for some foie gras. Nice. Very nice. Very fancy. I like that. Yeah. Mike says he wants to try individual Wellingtons. It's been on his list for a while, but it's intimidating. Don't be, especially if you're doing the individual ones, you don't have to roll it too tight because you can make into like almost like a square one. Uh, it's a lot easier to do an individual one than do the whole one. Awesome. Try one more time. Mm, good. All right. Let's go ahead and check our lamb chops. And then I can even use the blowtorch a little bit just to help uh, the broil because I have uh, gas it doesn't have the broil on top so I want to make sure that I burn a little bit more on the top so it makes it faster so I'm going to mute myself for the noise I love using the torch for different kind of uh hitting extra color and getting a little bit extra flavor and stuff it's one of the even when I use a pan sear or an oven sear like that, I love using it for filling in a little bit like Tiago's doing. It's such a great way to kind of add the most flavor and uh, make it look as pretty as possible. All right. So I have the lamb chops ready. I'm going to go ahead and put the cheese and the butter. Let me get the, the butter from the fridge. We always want to make sure that we use cold butter. When we finish something hot. Same thing we do risotto. Why do you use uh, cold butter instead of uh, hot butter? You just want to, because you want it to make cre uh, like a creamier te texture. So the cold butter melts slowly, but it's shocking the, in, the, in this case, the polenta. So it's shocking with the colder temperature with the hot. So it, it helps emulsify. The most when you're making, um, you're making like a pasta and you use a little bit of the pasta water, you use a little bit of the starch from the pasta water to the sauce. So it thickens a little bit. So it, the butter is pretty much doing that over here. Nice, I always knew that I was supposed to use cold, but I never knew why. <laughs> <laughs> 
let's see. And it tastes a little bit for salt now. Okay, I, I can use a little bit more salt. And I can use a little bit more cheese that I have reserved over here. So right now I'm just moving to spread the cheese and then the butter is already gone. So I don't know if you guys can see, we're gonna move a little closer. So that way you see how creamy it is, but it still have the grains because I used the coarse. Let me get a little closer, there you go. That's beautiful. Okay. So all I'm gonna do for this, I'm just gonna cover. I'm gonna use the heat that I have over here. Just cool this down because you don't wanna eat right now because it's too hot. And I'm gonna get the tomatoes and slice the lamb chops. Mike as usual is being inappropriate and says, mm, he would love to bathe in the polenta. <laughs> we did have the question at our, our hangout, cocktail hour hangout at the, uh, at the last summit, which was what food would you most want to take a bath in? And I think Plenta was on somebody's, uh, Plenta or Grits was on somebody's list in my group. <laughs> yeah, Plenta is definitely good, but you want to make sure that you cool a little bit so you won't burn yourself. <laughs> it's a very good call. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty looking knife there. Thank you very much. That's from my friends, uh, Forging Knife. They make uh, Japanese steel, rose wood, and they have this forge uh, carbon over here on the top too. So it gives it like a nice look. That's beautiful. All right. So we have the polenta, we have the lamb chops. Before I slice it, I wanted to skip the rice a little bit, even though we sous vide most of the time, but we put it in a broil and then we still torch it a little bit. So kind of like just the juices to relax and just go back to the place. And I go ahead and get the tomatoes. When you're done showing the meal, Mike has a good idea that you should show off your uh, salt and oil and make sure that we tell folks where they can order them as well. Oh yeah, yes. I'm I'm uh, setting up my Etsy account. Nice. But uh, you guys can send an email, uh, not an email, but uh, like a, a direct message on my Instagram, and then uh, you can get that. Is it too late to order those for Christmas or in the, the US at least, is it still a Christmassy enough time? Oh yes, definitely. Because uh, usually it takes uh, two to three days only to arrive. So I, yeah, you can definitely get for Christmas. So right now I have three, uh, sorry, four salts available. I have the, the shade of Verde, it's a, uh, it's a Brazilian inspire. So it's a parsley and scallions. I have truffles, fresh black truffles. I have uh, toasted peppers. So it's a combination of five different uh, pepper grounds uh, that it's being toasted, double toasted almost. And then the last one is smoked charcoal that I smoked the salt for 24 hours using three different woods and then I infuse with uh, activated charcoal. So it gives the black color to it. Mike is talking you up in the comments too, about how good they are. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be ordering <laughs> some of those, I think. I need to get my hands on some. It's not because I make, but they do taste good. 
<laughs> I'm not. I'm not only the owner. I'm a. I'm a customer as well. Is that the old uh, <laughs> hair oh, care? Yeah. <laughs> that, that ad. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Okay, so I'm getting ready to make a plate. So. Okay, so I believe I do have everything. So let's go ahead and cut the lamb chops because I know you guys are waiting for this. Just how I like it. It's amazing looking. Can you see it? Yeah, that looks so good. So of course it's your preference, right? Uh, some people like medium rare and rare, and I like my my lamb more towards the medium side to it. So that's why I sous vide at 130, and then a little bit more oven, a little bit of torch, so it goes up to about 135. So if you want medium rare, I would recommend maybe you sous vide at 125, and then start finishing all the process, and then going to get get you to maybe 130. Awesome. Okay, so let's go ahead and plate. I almost forgot. I have to put a little bit more cheese. Can't a forget the additional pepper. cheese. It'd be a disaster. I know. Right? I'm moving too quick, I guess. But I always like to put a little bit of butter on top. So by the time we're going to start eating, the butter going to start melting. And the tomatoes. John says when they did it, they accidentally made too much crust. Um, so they just added it on top of the polenta as well. And it was they enjoyed that as, as well. A little more flavor on top of everything. Oh, absolutely. More flavor, the better. Huh? So of course you can drizzle a little bit of uh, infused olive oil on top. Maybe more pepper. And this is it, guys. That looks delicious. I'm starving now, despite having eaten way too much pizza. Uh, John, how that look compared to yours? Do you have a? Do you end up taking a picture of yours at all uh, when you put it together? Oh, that's so good. Yeah. So this is it, guys. It's uh, uh, herbs and black garlic lamb chops. It would be sous vide at one thirty. And the polenta, creamy polenta with corn, uh, corn, corn meal, butter, uh, Parmigiano and Reggiano cheese. I cooked that in chicken broth and a little bit of a vegetable broth as well. The tomatoes could be confit with herbs and spices. So it's a good dish for the holidays. Uh, the polenta is just, uh, just a side dish, just same thing like the tomatoes, but it definitely is full of flavor. and. Uh, it's a good option for the holidays because you can make the whole rack, maybe two racks, and you put them like this uh, on a nice, beautiful cutting board. Everybody can cut a couple of slices and try. So I hope you guys enjoy. So that's dinner for me. It looks amazing, Tiago. John said that uh, it looked, uh, they didn't take a picture, but theirs did look close because the chef, pu the chef published a great dish with great instructions. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
Uh, if there's any final questions, please drop them in the comments, everyone. If not, give some love for Tiago. It's always great having him involved and showing some amazing things. And make sure you check out his olive oils, his smoked salts, all the amazing products and support him. Uh, Chef, anything else uh, you want to say to the group while you have the captive uh, audience here? Absolutely. I want like, again, again, I want to thank you guys for giving the opportunity to try and to make a, a dish for you guys. And especially, I hope I wish everybody a happy new year and a Merry Christmas. Oh, happy Christmas and new year to you too, Tiago. A lot of people are giving love in the comments and uh, a lot of them are excited uh, for what you just showed us and really appreciate you uh, always being here, uh, showing us all the cool stuff. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. You guys have a great day. Oh, and Tiago, do you want to mention the charity that the proceeds from this are going to at all? Oh, yes, absolutely. Thanks for reminding me, Mike. So all the all the profits or all, whatever you guys pay to be part of the class today, you're going to be donated to a local organization we have in Houston. And it started about 17 years ago that we, uh, we find families uh, with a low income and then we help them buying the Christmas list for their kids. So for this year, we have a very large goal that was to fulfill 50 kids, about 50 families uh, Christmas list. So definitely whatever you guys contributed today, you're gonna go towards something greater. Awesome, it's always great to support good, uh, good causes here. And I'm glad you brought that to our attention so we could help out with it. Uh, thank you again so much for coming, Tiago. It's always great working with you and I can't wait to uh, see what we have coming up next. Uh, at the ISVA, we have a lot coming on. I think all of you are on the newsletter now, so we'll be sure to reach out to you. I know we have some showcases coming up and our sous vide summit is coming up in, I believe, March or May. Mm -hmm. Mike always yells at me. One of those March. M months, <laughs> March, thank you. Yeah. Uh, March 12th to 14th. Uh, so that's gonna be a good time. I, hopefully Tiago will be involved in that as well. We'd always love to have you. And uh, we'll be having more of these cook-alongs coming up. Um, so if you're not a member of Champions, make sure you join. And if not, check your emails and see if any of the future ones uh, look appealing to you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. And Tiago, thanks again. And uh, Valerie, thanks a lot for being behind the camera and making sure everything <laughs> ran smoothly. I know sometimes the most important work is behind the camera. So good job yes. <laughs> to, to both of you. And I'll let you enjoy your, your great dinner now. Uh, thank you so thank much, you everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. Thank you.